our industry. So here we go. We are live now. Yeah, that's true. I've probably been on Instagram for like, I that's don't know, uh, like on Instagram. So there's very few people actually using it in the research industry now. Um, but it starts with a ripple and then it just kind of extends out. This is true. All right. So we're going to start our second webinar, Contracts and Budgets. All right. And there's Chris Sauber. This is Dance Fair. I'm Chris Sauber. And we're also live streaming this. So we wanted first to talk about um, the services we provide. So we do, we provide research clinics or research companies with a lot of services. We, we uh, broker studies, but we're not really study brokers, but we'll help you find studies. We'll help you recruit study participants. We'll help you negotiate contracts and budgets, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, what else do we do? We help you expand. So whether you're trying to expand your clinic into um, a more diversified clinic where you can take on all different types of studies, we can help you do that. We can help you find investigators to be able to conduct these trials for you. Um, SOPs is huge, and we've helped a lot of sites with that. Um, also, expansion into other geographic regions. So a lot of sites are looking to not just expand at the size of their site, but once they've done that, they want to actually expand in different regions to so have like a, physically have a separate site. Uh, we help a lot of sites. We actually partner with a lot of sites who employ some of these models as well, like the SMO model, although that kind of has a bad reputation, that name. Um, so we don't really call it SMO model, but it is. I mean, if you're opening up a bunch of clinics with different doctors, uh, you're an SMO, right? So why specifically does SMO have a bad name? They just do. I don't know. I think because it, it has something to do with budget. No, it has something contracts. to do with the quality of the studies that were being provided by these SMOs. Uh, the, yeah, the quality of the data that they were providing wasn't really up to par with the other sites that were not SMO. So the individual sites do better do better work. Uh, yeah, and I think a lot of sites that are, that are using an SMO model are still using that business model, but they brand themselves as something else, kind of like us. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of our sites are behave as an SMO, but we don't brand ourselves as an SMO. Mm -hmm. So anyways, we're going to be talking about contracts and budgets. Oh, and by the way, one more quick plug is Interlinks Via. So they have a brand new uh, tool that you can use, virtual workspaces. So remote monitoring is something that's here. It's something that is going to become increasingly more prevalent as time goes on. Uh, HIPAA is a huge issue with a lot of medical institutions and hospitals and a lot of research sites, unfortunately, are still uploading patient confidential information on things like Google Drive. Now, you have a web link for Interlink Via, right, that shows how it works. Yes. Can you put that on this? Uh, I think I can, but I'm not sure how to do that right now. Okay. But it's on my, I just know how to screen share, which is what we're going to be doing soon. Okay. So I'll maybe our next one, I'll do that. It's like a 90-minute video explaining how Intralinks Via works. But if you go to my blog, theclinicaltrialsguru.com, and you click on the Powered by Intralinks tab at the top, you'll learn all about them. I recommend every site use it, every CRO use it. Um, this hospital just got fined two hundred and eighteen thousand dollars, somewhere in Boston. Yeah, for having using a shared drive. I think they were using Google Drive actually mm -hmm. for having uh, uploading their patient uh, Sorry, contact info. HIPAA violation, major HIPAA violation, because Google Docs is not uh, HIPAA compliant. It's not FDA CFR twenty one part eleven compliant. And with Interlinks, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. It's one way we manage all of our sites and another way that each individual site manages itself and fosters uh, collaboration amongst the staff members there. So all good stuff. If you're interested in any of these services, email me after dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com or you can call or text 949-415-2000. 
6256. You can do it now. I will get back to you. Um, if you have a question, maybe for the webinar, someone on Periscope. They showed your wrist. Exactly Apple Watch. Playing. People know this is an Apple Watch, oh, right? They do. So I wouldn't know. I'm using my phone to, to Periscope right now, so I won't be able to reply with that. But well, actually, is it Bluetooth connected? No, right now it's not connected. I have my phone in airplane mode. So you can't text me now, but you can text me and I will be able to get back to you as soon as we're done live streaming. All right? Fair enough. Anything else we need to plug? All right, you covered it all. All right, so we're going to talk about contracts and budgets. So the last webinar we did, we got into great detail on how to get more studies for your research company, how to biz dev. And today, I brought in Chris. Well, Chris was on the last one. Well, You'll be on all of them. I will. Right? Yeah, you're an it's expert in all of them. Me, but okay. You're an expert on every subject, but especially oh, contracts, nice especially contracts and budgets. Okay. Right? Yeah. So Chris, I used to negotiate a lot of the contracts and budgets for my sites probably from 2005 until what, like 2012? Sounds right. And after 2012, Chris took over and my main duty was to get more studies or to establish our partnership with other sites. Uh, a lot of biz dev, a lot of sales and marketing. And this man right here is responsible for all our contracts and budgets. And I help occasionally or I'll get involved when there's an issue that maybe Chris needs some input on, right? Mm -hmm. Not really advice, but just some feedback from someone else. So there's a lot we can talk about and we're gonna try to keep this webinar under an hour. So with that being said, Chris, um, where do you wanna start? It's your webinar. Okay, so let's start with this first, all right? When you get a study, when can a site expect to receive their contract and budget? Because a lot of sites don't get this until a few weeks before their site initiation visit. Uh, that actually sounds pretty standard to me. Um, once your site's been selected, you can expect the, the budget and contract shortly thereafter. So, so things have changed a bit recently, it seems that uh, a lot of sponsors are selecting sites prior to a site selection visit. In other words, they're sending out the budgets and contracts before the site selection visits even occurred. That's happened a number of times in the last year. Um, I don't know why they're going that route. Maybe the feasibility questionnaire alone, as long as the site doesn't uh, uh, counter anything that they've seen in the feasibility questionnaire, the site is essentially selected. So it's just a formality, the site selection visit. Therefore, uh, just to, because time is money, to get the ball moving or rolling, um, they send out the budget to get that negotiated. So typically you can expect to receive the contract and budget concurrently with the reg docs, like the IRB submissions. Actually, in a lot of your feasibility surveys, or even, beforehand. Or even before the reg docs. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of your surveys, they're actually going to ask, hey, do you need IRB approval before you can start negotiating contracts and budgets? The answer usually is no, but unless you have a whole bunch of studies and you don't necessarily want to waste time until you know whether a study is going to be lucrative for you or not, which is another thing we're going to get into on this webinar. Um, so I guess right from the beginning, what, where I notice a lot of sites make a mistake is they'll receive the protocol, because usually you get the protocol first before you get a budget, mm -hmm. right? And then you can kind of look at some of the procedures, and if you've been doing this long enough, you can gauge whether you think the study is going to be lucrative or not, right? I agree with that. Is that typically what you do? Sure. If uh, there's relatively relatively few assessments in the protocol, uh, simple to look at the table of assessment of the table of assessments. Uh, if there's very few things in that table. Um, you can expect a relatively small budget. If uh, there's ink all over that table, uh, you can expect a, a fairly nice budget. So the more procedures, the bigger the budget. Yep. Right. Simple as that. And so what what should sites? Because when I when I get a, a protocol, that's one of the first things I do. I look at the schedule of assessments, and then I kind of gauge internally whether this study is going to be worth my time or not. And a lot of the studies we've been getting lately, these phase four studies, they look really simple, 
right? And they typically are. And they're deceptively simple. And I just wrote an article for IntroLinks. It should be going on their blog soon, the Collaborista blog, about what sponsors can do to make phase four studies more lucrative, right? And it involves virtual workspaces, basically taking a lot of the workload and responsibility away from the sites. Because in these type of studies, typically what a sponsor is looking for is collecting some data. And uh, you can take a lot of the mundane tasks away from the sites by having virtual workspaces and having the real world staff, as they call them, um, handle a lot of the actual data collection. Hmm. Right? So, okay, you get the protocol, you decide you want to do the study, you have your SSV, then you have, then you'll probably get your contract and budget if your SSV went well. As soon as the site selected, yes. As soon as the site selected, but you don't always get a letter that notifying you that you're selected right away. Well, your letter is the contract and budget. Okay, so if you, if, in the email, there will be something that say, states you've been selected and you'll find the contract and budget attached. Okay, and oftentimes, it doesn't happen that often, but uh, uh, you will actually receive the contract and budget like immediately when you receive the protocol. Yeah, that's what I was discussing earlier, where prior to the site selection visit, they're now selecting the site. In other words, right. they, they look at the feasibility questionnaire, and they say, oh, the site can handle this study. The site's perfect for it. Yeah. Yeah. And so long as when we come out for the site selection visit, nothing too much deviates from what was in the feasibility questionnaire, the site will be selected. And and just to get the ball rolling, you negotiate. they want the budget negotiated prior to even the site selection visit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I don't like doing, personally. No, because you don't know whether whether the study is going to be worth your while. Even though you have the budget there, you may not know whether you can actually do it until you learn more about it from the CRA. Does, when does they come over speak, to your yeah. site, right? Okay, so here's where a lot of sites go wrong is, especially the ones that don't have very many studies and are just excited to get any study. And we know several people like this, mm -hmm. right? They receive a budget, and they look at the protocol, but they don't superimpose the protocol over the budget like the most important thing you can do is go to that schedule of assessments in every protocol and look at every single item that needs to be completed for every visit right and then when you have your budget compare that to the budget and if you don't know what a certain procedure is you better ask somebody who does right good time to email you or email a doctor like we just had we just had a question on a brain surgery study we're doing where neither Chris nor I knew anything about this procedure. So we had to call up the neurosurgeon and ask him. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. yesterday. Yeah, just yesterday. So a lot of sites that, that come across uh, procedures that they may not be familiar with, rather than asking somebody, they just go ahead and negotiate whatever. They mark up whatever is on the budget by like 30%. Right, and that might be way too low for what that procedure actually entails. Right, it may require a hospital stay, it may require special equipment that you don't even have, and then who's going to pay for all that stuff? Right. Well, you are if you agree to the budget. Yeah, or you're, you're going to have to. Mm -hmm. So, do you ever superimpose the uh, protocol schedule of assessments over the line items in the budget? Sure. No, when you say superimpose, I don't actually take. Uh two sheets and lay them over one another. No, no, figuratively speaking. Yes, yes yeah. of course. So should I get into our budget now, our sample budget? Sure. I'll do a screen share for the people on Periscope you won't be able to see, but you'll be able to follow along with what we're saying. Okay, so here's our sample budget. And Chris, just take us through some of this stuff. So is this like based on a real study or yes. what is this? This is an actual budget, an agreed upon budget for an actual study. Uh, all identifiers have been marked off, of course. Um, and it's, I would think, uh, relatively simple, um, self-explanatory per line item. Um, now, is this before you negotiated or after? No, this is the final budget. I couldn't find the original budget that they sent. Okay. But if memory serves correctly, I, I think it was approximately 50% less than this. So this is a 50% markup. Correct. The overall uh, total 
patient completion budget. So I believe the patient completion for this is around 18,000. If you scroll over to the right, I actually know it's right there. 17,563, 17, yeah. 17,563, you get a $5,000 non-refundable startup. Now, did you have to negotiate this? Yes. So yeah. what did they give us originally? Everything you have to negotiate. Now, initially on this budget, I believe it was 3,000. Um, and I don't really remember, I don't think they included any storage fees. Um, so you threw that in there? Correct. Uh, you have to bear in mind that uh, the sponsor is a business and trying to make the most money possible. And the less they can conduct research for, the better for them. Uh, some sponsors are a little bit more, um, uh, how to put it in a nice way, uh, legitimate in the sense that uh, they include all costs and they, they come in relatively close to what you would expect for a budget. Others, uh, they want to try and save some money. And so what I'm noticing here is that all the procedures pay the same, right, for every visit. Correct. Right? Yep. right except uh, here you got evaluating the, the dose. The, the reason for that is in this particular study, um, this one has phone call visits and uh, in the office clinic visits. So the phone call visits pay less because there's less work to be done. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's go through some of these line items. So a lot of these are standard, and the way we, the way you're supposed to come up with this, and the way the Sunshine Act works is, and we had our Sean Kulkarni on like so many times. He's uh, an attorney who specializes in pharma law. Or well, not specialized, he focuses on pharma law. Mm -hmm. And, um, so basically, sponsors, they have to report everything um, to the FDA as far as what they're compensating doctors, physicians. And unfortunately, clinical trials is part of that. So you may see some doctors, like because these are all public documents, when you get the Sunshine Act, uh, uh, I guess the uh, transparency of all the numbers and how much each sponsor is paying each doctor, a lot of the general public assumes that um, this is all speaking fees and just marketing fees, when a lot of the times it's research. I have a question. And the doctor doesn't even receive the entire amount. Most of the amount goes to the sites. So they would show, let's say this site, right, has 17,500 per patient, right? For a completed patient. For a completed patient, and the site enrolls 10. So that's 170, right? Yeah. Pharma will report that that PI made that much money. OK, so they take the whole. They take the growth. The whole budget, or do they take, because I believe on this budget. No, they take the actual payments that the site got, and they don't attribute it to the site, they attribute it to the PI. Okay. So a lot of doctors on paper look like they're making so much money from pharma. Now, this budget doesn't do it, but uh, most budgets, I would say 75% of them now, they break down a fee for the coordinator and the principal investigator. They have a fee for each visit. Now. And it depends on how much work is involved for each participant for that study visit. Mm -hmm. Is that a way around the Sunshine Act? In other words, they only have to report what the doctor is being paid for that visit, or would you know? If it's in the line, if it's here, yeah, it's the a line, line item. It's a line item. It says so. It's behind all this stuff. Yeah, principal investigator fee is for this visit. Well, the way the way they report is actually through the uh, tax forms that they sent to the site. Oh. So, so it's it'll be gross and now. includes transportation reimbursements. Okay. Everything so it's like a, stipends? Yeah. So it's oh. like a real misrepresentation of what PIs are actually making. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. And then you have all these patients out there, like whistleblowers, saying, oh, my doctor's under the influence of Big Pharma. Look how much he made last year. Mm -hmm. And so something like five million, when they don't realize this guy works for a huge research site, he's just one of many investigators, and they're a high enrolling site and all the gross revenues for his studies get reported as income to him, not to the IRS, but through the Sunshine Act for the public to look at. Hmm. So you can actually manipulate a lot of that data and then come up with things what like, hey, my doctor's influenced to prescribe certain medications because look how much Pfizer paid him. Yeah, what is it they say about statistics? What is it that they say? in regards to you can manipulate statistics to prove anything you would like. Oh, yeah, you can use statistics to prove anything you'd like. And this certainly sounds that's the case. Right, right. But, okay, so back to the Sunshine Act. So 
a good way, a general way to know what's fair. So the first rule when it comes to negotiating budgets, right, is to make sure absolutely under no instance whatsoever that you're losing money on any procedure, yeah. right? No, that's a good place to start. There's no, you should not be losing money on any line item, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The only one that should be break even is maybe transportation reimbursement and the study participant reimbursement, which you obviously can't make a profit off of. Uh, patient segments here, it's usually $50 a visit. This one's 35. Seems like it's like a thing. That's what it is. Okay, and then 50 50. So you can't make profit on patient stipends and you can't make profit on. Do you have transportation in here or is that in the contract? Um, I think that's an invoiceable item in the contract. In the contract, okay. I'm wondering if we have a sample contract we could look at. Um, we can put it up. We can have the links on there to the Google Drive, like the sample contract for this study. Mm -hmm. We'll just have to de identify the sponsor information. All right, so on everything else, you can actually make profit, okay? So, uh, clinic visit, okay, 150 bucks. So what does that, what does that actually mean? Just, just means uh, when the patient comes to the office, you're getting paid a flat rate of $150. Um, <clears throat> that, to me, that, that's just an overall uh, general fund that captures things that may have not been captured per line item in the rest of the budget. Um, I, I don't know what all line items are on this budget, but it, for example, maybe an IVRS call or mm -hmm. things of that nature, which weren't captured individually. Having to run to the store and get some dry ice for the visit, the shipment of the blood samples, that kind of thing. Okay. So to go back to my rule number one, do not lose money on any line item. It, that's Warren Buffett's rule for investing, by the way, is rule number one, do not lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one, right? So the same thing applies to contracts and budgets. So how do you know what's fair in your market? Well, if you work with a with a doctor at, that has a medical practice, chances are he has someone that does his billing or helps him do his billing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to find out through that person what the fair market value is in your area, because every area is different, for Medicare reimbursements. Yeah, but that's the fair market value. That's how you know you're not losing money. Now, that's not, I'm not saying that's what you're, you're going to negotiate. Oh, again. Thank you. That's just the starting point. You're not going to take right. anything less than that. Absolutely not. Well, no, you're not going to take Medicare costs at all, I would hope. At all. But I bring it up because when sponsor is out of line with something, and they'll say, hey, this is way too high. You can actually point to Medicare and say, actually, we're not even going to be making money on this line item mm -hmm. if you reimburse us at this rate, and we're going to want our overhead or whatever it might be. And on this budget, we'll get back to this. There is an overhead, so we'll get back to that right now. All in mm -hmm. All right, we're going to talk about that. Chris, we're going to talk about this. Because you have, which is capturing what the overhead captures as well. Okay. So Medicare is the absolute minimum, but you're not going to take just that, right? Mm -hmm. So what would you do in that case, Chris? Let's say collecting medical history, Medicare would reimburse what, like eighty bucks, seventy bucks. Sounds about right. So what would you do? How did you get that to one fifty? Uh, no, again, I'm speaking off the top of my head here. I don't remember for certain. You essentially doubled it. I would. I tend to believe that on this budget, most of the line items were at around Medicare costs, uh, what they reimburse at Medicare costs for. Okay, with the initial budget? With the initial budget they sent. Okay, so they did their homework, they put in Medicare costs. Or approximately so. Mm -hmm. um, probably the low end of it too. Mm -hmm. And they probably don't go by different regions, they just have one. No, I, th I think it was around what the costs were. Like for example, medical history, I think it was probably around a hundred dollars <throat> because this budget was marked uh we were able to negotiate about a 50 percent increase okay which would mean that would be hmm. around a hundred dollars so um and the sponsors are aware that they're going to pay a premium i i believe so they're trying to change this uh for research 
um, they're not going to find many sites that are willing to do research for Medicare cost. And I apologize, but I forget what was your question. So how did you get that if Medicare, was typically how would you take one of these line items and say, okay, this is what the sponsor gave me, and then how do you justify? So this is how I began back in 2012, as Dan alluded, this is why I took this over. Um, I took previous budgets that had been negotiated, whether it be by Dan or somebody else, and I got a feel for what sponsors were willing to pay for each line item. Um, now, the funny thing is, is some sponsors may be willing to pay a lot more than what the ECG pays here. I've seen some sponsors pay $300 for an ECG. So why, why are some sponsors different than others? They just have different costs they're willing to accept for different assessments. So, so your job is to find out where those are and maximize that. Absolutely. And that's how I approach each budget. I take every line item and see what was the max that we've been able to receive from a sponsor previously. And that's what I put down and then some. So every budget you negotiate, you put in a database and then you can use it for later. Correct. So with every budget you negotiate, you're getting better. Yeah. yeah. You're okay. getting more data, you're getting more support for your prices. Absolutely. There's no real magic to this, to negotiate in budgets, you just have to be willing to do it. And a lot of people are not comfortable with this. Yeah, let's talk about that, and we'll get back into this budget. But why people uh, are afraid to negotiate? Like, okay, I'll tell you why. So when I first got in this business, uh, I was so happy to just get any study, like any. I was just happy to have a study, mm -hmm. right? A sponsor or a CRO was willing to look at my startup and my inexperienced PI and say, all right, you can have a study. So I, and I think I didn't even negotiate the budget, I just accepted it, yeah. right? Um, if I were a sponsor, I would have found that kind of off. Yeah, I just, whatever they gave me, well, I was like, all right, let's go with it. I do believe a lot of people do that. I know some engineers. A, a lot of do. people do that. We, Yeah, we do know a few people that do that, despite the fact that we told them. You must negotiate. And by the way, a quick plug, we can negotiate your contracts and budgets for you. Well, right. Happily do so. Happily do so. We're trying to raise prices in the industry, and we're trying to get everyone to negotiate better budgets. It makes it better for everyone. Mm -hmm. All the sites in the industry, it's a win-win. Yep. Right. So give me a call or email, 949-415-6256, or dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com. We can work out some kind of retainer option for you, where you pay us a monthly fee, and we'll negotiate all your budgets for you, You'll make it up in the first budget. First budget we do. If, if you're one of those that uh, that do not negotiate budgets, which let's get into right now, and then we'll get back to this budget because I have more questions. So we'll do the screen share again. Um, so yeah, that was my reason. So there's lots of reasons. Like we know someone who's probably and he's experienced. He does a lot of studies. He's a clinician, well, and he just for 20 years. He doesn't like more. to negotiate. He likes to treat patients. And he likes to conduct his studies, but he's not a businessman, mm -hmm. and he doesn't have any anyone at his site that negotiates budgets for him. So he's the de facto guy. He's the owner. He's just uncomfortable asking for more money. And so, what? How do you get over that? Besides calling us and having us do it for you? Uh, well, I don't really know why or how this originates in the first thing. I mean, you can compare it to buying a car. Everybody knows that when you go into a car lot, that you don't necessarily have to pay that cost. So you have to be willing to sit down with the car salesman and negotiate a better price. However, I believe a lot of people just pay what's being asked. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if they lease the vehicle, and that's a whole different topic, but they're paying more than the, the cost of the vehicle. So pretty soon, these people, at these sites, like the people we know that refuse to negotiate budgets, right? Mm -hmm. One thing they do is they try to call other sites that they know are doing the study and say, hey, what did they what did they agree on with you because you're actually negotiating? You get these calls all the time, I do. right? Mm -hmm. So they call Chris and say, hey, man, um, I have to negotiate this budget, but I don't really know what to tell them or, um, I mean, what do they even ask you? Well, it depends on at what point in the process I'm brought up on, and I, it varies, but uh, I've had people say, 
you know, they're not willing to increase this line item. Um, and while I agree with what Dan's saying, you don't want to take a loss on any line item. No, you do not lose money. If you break even but make up for it on another line item, that's acceptable. Yeah. Okay. And you have to look at the whole thing. The whole picture, yes. Don't sweat the small stuff. Look at the whole thing. Yep. Yep. So. Um, and we'll get back into a perfect example of this. Just remind me. Okay. Um, and uh, this actually came up recently, is what Polly Dan is talking about. Um, so you want to look at the whole picture. Um, and I guess just a general rule of thumb, I would expect that initial budget that is sent by the sponsor to be increased to approximately 50% as a general rule. Uh, it may actually be more, it may actually be a little less, but in general, 50% more. So your goal should be to try to get, just try to double everything. Right? Initially, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So when these people call you, is that the advice that that you give them? Like another site that calls you and says, "Hey, man, they really want me to neg to negotiate this budget. I know I need to, but I don't even know where to get started." Is that your general advice? Like just double everything? That, yeah, that, that's the easiest way to go. They, just, just double everything. Now you're going to get a lot of sponsors are going to laugh at that. Or the last why, right? right. The last for proof of why you need these amounts. Or and then, do we have proof for a lot of these things? I know we have an overhead policy, so we can generally get our overhead taken care of. Yeah, I've actually provided uh, uh, other budgets from other sponsors to show that uh, yes, this is what these line items have been reimbursed from previous studies. Perfect example. Another perfect example is that uh, one inpatient study we were negotiating. For pediatrics, mm -hmm. and the sponsor was asking us what we're willing to accept for an overnight stay. And we, when we called around and asked specific hospitals that specialize in uh, yeah. pediatric care, mm -hmm. there was like eight thousand dollars a night. Yeah, and the Ridiculous. sponsor was giving us like nine hundred dollars a night. Yep. So if we wouldn't have done our homework and checked. We would have accepted it and then not had any place to send them. Well, we wouldn't have accepted 900, but we certainly wouldn't have raised it to 8,000. Right. No one would uh, would even think of doing that. So another example is our brain surgery study. Mm -hmm. So we there's no real Medicare comparison to a particular procedure that we're doing, but in the budget, it's very lucrative. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we talk to the hospitals, the various hospitals, uh, we have like three hospitals in mind. We're trying to work work it with one. We're trying to negotiate it at a significant reduction to what we're actually going to be getting because we want we want that one particular line item to be where the majority of our profit comes from. Mm -hmm. So, is this a viable strategy for sites when it comes to inpatient studies or uh, surgeries like? studies like the surgery one, where one procedure, one line item can make up for everything else. Oh, absolutely. You can, you, you can approach it from that angle, but as we already had said, if, if they're unwilling to go to whatever price point you're asking for on that particular line item, you can make up for it elsewhere as well. Um, it's certainly simpler or more simple to reap all of your profits on one line item. I mean, if, if the sponsors were willing, and I've actually done this in a budget in which uh, they sent a budget that just had total cost per patient. They had no line items on the budget. They didn't even have. Oh, money. yeah. I remember this one. Yeah. So it was like, well, you know, uh, since we're not negotiating line items, and I'm sure they do this to for lower costs. Um, I just told them, well, okay, increase the budget by 100%. And what did they tell you? I think we agreed on about 35% increase. 35. So they, they just sent you the budget without any line items and said, here's what you'll get for each patient mm -hmm. visit. It's up to you to go look at the protocol. At the table of schedule of assessments. Yeah, go look at all the schedule of assessments. You do your own math. Mm -hmm. Add it all up. Make sure, hope to God that you're not missing anything. Right. Right, and then let us know if this budget is acceptable. Mm -hmm. And was that budget acceptable when you did the math? Yeah, it was acceptable. It wasn't a great budget, but it was certainly uh, 
I would say within reason of costs uh, other budgets. And then you doubled it. Yeah, and asked for double. <laughs> and did they give it to you? Oh, 35 percent. Okay, was that before overhead and all that? Uh, that included overhead. All right, so we're going to talk about overhead now because that's a, and I'm going to go back to screen sharing, and I will have the Periscope people, the few of you that are left. I'll look at it. So about overhead, right? I get asked this question often, like every day, man. Somebody and I'm willing. I'm willing to share my overhead policy with you. Mm -hmm. We're willing to do that. Okay. So if you want to use our overhead policy, just email me Dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com or call or text me nine four nine four one five six two five six. Again, it's nine four nine four one five six two five six. So it might be a little blurry for you live streamers, <clears throat> but overhead. So I noticed 25, our policy is 40. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here? Well, as I alluded to earlier, the clinic visit, they're already reimbursing for a lot of the costs that are included in the overhead policy. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I assume that's what, I mean, so when, that you think that's what, when you think about that line item as forks, I wasn't really certain. Clinic visit to me. So yeah, I've never actually seen that before. A patient comes into the office, there's costs associated with this, so you're being reimbursed. That's uh, what the overhead is as well. There's costs not uh, delineated in the budget per line item, and you're, you're getting a, an overall general fund for those things not mentioned in the Aligned assessments. So you think that's a new strategy? Like because just like we're us as sites are getting smarter, well, hopefully getting smarter. I mean, those of you watching and those of you that are figuring it out on your own or networking amongst yourselves, we're getting smarter at negotiating budgets, mm -hmm. right? I you think so. sponsors are getting smarter on their end? Oh, of, uh, Again, it's a business. So this clinic visit could, because I'd rather if I were the sponsor, pay 150 bucks a visit. Than an extra fifteen percent on the overhead, right? It's a, or does it work out to be the same? It's about the same. So it's not a strategy that they're using. Well, it could be because I believe the overhead came in a lot less than that. Oh, the initial their initial overhead was what, like ten percent? Ten, fifteen, something like that. Okay. So now normally, if you have something documented and it seems legit, um, they will approve it. Like our overhead policy, forty percent. Right. Or they'll take it to the sponsor for approval because, if, uh, and this is something we can get into, oftentimes what you're asking for exceeds the limits the CRO has been given for that line item by the sponsor. So they have to get approval from the sponsor to okay paying this amount for that line item. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So is this the only budget you've actually seen that on? The clinic visit, yes. Yeah. You think you're going to see more of that? Mm, it's hard to say. Um, I'm sure they're not they're not sharing this strategy necessarily with other sponsors. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, I can't remember if this is CRO or sponsor only, but you know they're going to share this with others. Hey, this works for us. It might work for you. No, you know they're going to. That's that's competitive advantage for them. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it would have to come from the site to the CRO and the sponsor that, hey, you know, this this sponsor did this. Uh, you may want to consider that. And why would a site do that? So, no, I don't necessarily think it will catch on. Okay. Cold, though. And now this $5,000 non-refundable fee, was it refundable at first? No. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that in a budget. Uh, sometimes you'll see, like, they will pay you the entire amount. That as an advance, like this whole yes. seventeen thousand five six three, of course, as an advance that will be deducted from you later. And typically, you see that on what kind of studies? Um, well, the studies that I, I've only seen that on two or three budgets, and they all seem to include a inpatient stay. That's what I've seen them on. Okay, where they're paying an upfront uh, full patient uh, completion mm -hmm. of the budget. Um, and I assume that's to cover the cost that you may have to pay, uh, you know, the hospital stay. Right. In case the, the site isn't, uh, doesn't have a lot of cash on hand. 
<clears throat> I would assume. Now, a few more things as we wrap up, right? So any of these things, especially when you're negotiating uh, for a study that your site typically does not conduct, um, meaning outside of your therapeutic expertise, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of sites are doing now because the market's slow. The market might be slow for their medical indication studies that they're used to. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you see something that you don't know what it is, like mm -hmm. let's say this Epworth sleepiness scale. Okay, mm -hmm. I've never seen this. So how do you know whether sixty dollars is is uh, fair? Well, um, within the protocol, you can you can look up what exact that is. And and to be honest with you, I didn't know what that was either. Um, so looking in the protocol to see what it is, and you can calculate approximately what kind of time it's going to take to complete this um, from the definition of the assessment. So uh, without actually seeing the assessment, just you know what entailed what is entailed in the assessment, you can get an idea. And sixty dollars for a, a two-minute assessment isn't bad. All right. Now let's see. Was there anything else I wanted to ask here? Um. Oh. Okay. So I'll stop screen sharing through all that stuff. So we got a study recently where, the, and this is a part where new sites or even experienced sites can get uh, almost conned into. Right? Is this local lab thing? Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. like we're doing a study now. We didn't realize the cost uh, initially when we were negotiating the budget, <laughs> and this is an experienced uh, budget negotiator, right? So I know it's happened to other sites. In fact, I'm networking with other sites that have this study. Well, the CRO is not happy with this either. The uh, CRO is not happy with us. No, no, no. With with what? Why the sponsor chose this route? Because ah, okay. in the contract, it just says they will reimburse their cost. Okay. For the labs, and that's what was was negotiated. Uh, I just wasn't aware of the cost as much as it does to have these particular labs performed. And then the sponsor, have they come back to us now and said that they will approve it? No, it was already approved by contract. Okay. That they will reimburse that cost. You just have to provide an invoice. So watch out for those local labs because I There's, mean you need to have cash on hand to be able to pay a fifteen hundred dollar. Yeah. You know for a fifteen hundred dollar lab. And if you're like we take it for granted, most of our studies are central labs, so they provide us the lab kits, we draw the blood, we process it, we ship it out, something that they're literally doing right now. Um, with a local lab, you don't do that. You send them to Quest or whatever local lab we, you use. In our case we use Quest. And pay for it ourselves. Pay for it out of pocket. And then you invoice. And then invoice, collect a whole bunch of invoices because we're high and rolling. And everyone who screens gets to go to the local lab. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the price was ridiculous. It was what yeah. was it, fifteen hundred dollars? Mm -hmm. And you're looking at, uh, I mean, because we're not doing invoices each and every time this occurs. It's we're batching them. Right. So you might be six months, eight months out to seeing reimbursement for this. So if you're screening like ten patients a month, yeah, that's uh fifteen grand mm -hmm. in local lab fees Alone. that you're paying out of pocket, and hopefully you're invoicing them. Fast enough so you can get the cash flow situation. Mm -hmm. That's before you do anything else, just the local lab fee. Yep. Right? So, what we could have done is use a different local lab. Uh, probably would have been a little cheaper, not much. Some wouldn't even do it. That's why we went with Quest. Um, but then you'd have to change all the reg docs and you'd have to delay the study. So, we decided to stick with them because mm -hmm. they were approved. And for a while, we know that they're willing to reimburse us now, and by contract, they're, they're obligated to do that. But one of their initial responses to you was, we don't know yet. That was the CRO. Oh, that was the CRO. Yeah. OK. So they I weren't just, aware of the situation. I, just, I wasn't aware that it was going to cost as much as it did. And I just wanted to make sure that we were going to reimburse the whole amount, even though it's stipulated. So that, the that's going to be an expensive study for those sponsors. Yeah. And they probably didn't even figure that. No, they didn't. The CRO says they have no idea why the sponsor chose to go this route because they presented it to them. It's better to use a local lab. That yeah, that's like conversation with the that's CRO. like the old model. Like a lot of hospitals and academic institutions are are uh, are built for that to have local lab there, so it's easier for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the private clinics like ours, like all of ours actually, mm -hmm. um, it's not that conducive to what we're doing. It's actually a hassle. 
and it ends up costing everybody more money, right? But the idea of using the local lab is you can get your results right away, which is not really the case with Quest. You okay. can, I think there's an additional cost. I think they can provide immediate results or almost immediate. Okay. You can have them within two hours. But what do we get it at? I think it's two days. Two days. All right. So it's not like you can get it right away. No, you can for an additional cost. For an additional cost. Okay. So if a patient comes in with an AE, the PI determines they need to get results now. run like a full panel and they want results that day, they'll just pay an extra fee and do it. Right. So that's one of the advantages of using a local lab. But even if you're using a central lab, the PI can still order the patient to go to any local lab just to get those results. And you'll, you'll see it from a central lab within two days as well. Usually you have results in about two days. Right, right. But if you want it that day, yeah. the PI can still do that oh, even absolutely. if they're using central lab. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if it's in the, if it's the safety is concerned for the patient, the, the sponsor typically, and I'm sure I'll always, will reimburse. All right. Now, last thing as we wrap up, right, um, invoicing, right? So in, in the contract, we have usually invoiceable items, mm -hmm. such as what? What would they be? Uh, well, it depends on how the contract's laid out. Uh, we have a study recently in which we've never had so many invoiceable items. You had, to in, you had to invoice for patient stipends for all of them. Wow. You had to invoice for any transportation costs. Do you need receipts for this stuff? Yes. You, do. you need receipts for everything that you invoice for. Uh, invoice for dry eyes. Um, you can invoice for. Uh, you have to invoice for the storage fees, which you saw in the budget. Um, the, the particular budget we used as an example was 1500 so you have to invoice for that. Also, the startup fee typically you have to invoice for. Often that's sent by the sponsor without an invoice, but also often you have to. It's about 50 50. 50% 50 of the time you have to invoice for it, 50% of the time you have to, or they'll just send it. Mm -hmm. um, other invoiceable items, uh, advertising costs. Um, this particular study, the one for the with the budget that we have there, um, they weren't reimbursing for advertising, so there is no reimbursement for that. But typically, you will have some sort of amount allotted towards um, advertising, but you have to reimburse for, or you have to invoice for that. So, who do you recommend do the invoicing at the site? Is it the coordinator? I know here it's you. Mm -hmm. Who would you recommend the other sites out there watching? to delegate as this person because I know if you give it to someone who's a non-owner of the site unless they have some incentive to do it it just becomes another thing that they have to do sure. like we couldn't ask one of our coordinators to do this unless we give them an incentive it. somehow or oversee it yeah like hey we'll give you like 10 percent of uh, well, what we get of course you can delegate any task um, just to make I, sure that it's getting done exactly with the invoice it's uh, pertinent to your site that you receive these funds so what I, if I were to delegate, I would ask the coordinator to please prepare the invoices and when you're done, bring them to me and I'll send them off just so I can see that they were done. All right. Anything else major or important that we left out on contracts and budgets? Um, Identification is a big one, right? You need your PI identify. That's usually standard. But well, thankfully, we've never had a situation in which we have had to recall uh, call on this. Uh, for the sponsor to come in and uh, legally represent our site. Um, and talking to other, I'm not going to mention the site, but I, you, you were there. Uh, they thought the indemnification clause was, uh, it was really, a, it served no purpose. Because they felt that the sponsor would find a way around having to. And they probably could. Yeah, having to represent you. Yeah, because the way it is, is they will. Uh, they will cover all legal costs and um, as long as the study was performed according, according to, the to protocol, protocol, right? And they can find any way. I mean, anytime you have a monitoring visit, they can find something at any visit sure. if they really wanted to. That says, "Hey, not necessarily deviation, but yeah, you didn't really follow the protocol here. You use your own judgment, and that's what caused." So, if it comes down to money like that, you you really need that clause in there. I think I would right? agree. I would. I agree, but I'm saying we've we've talked to some people, some doctors that really don't think it serves a purpose. Yeah, and I disagree. Right. No, I disagree. I I think the indemnification clause, depending upon the sponsor, I think uh, in all walks of life and business, you'll have people that are have good character and would be willing to 
to follow mm -hmm. what you believe they should. And then, of course, others will cut every corner that they can. So closely related to this is uh, medical malpractice. Mm -hmm. So what are they asking for the coverage now? It used to be one million. Then I saw two million. I think it's three now. Actually. Now it's three. So by next year, maybe it's four. Could be. Right. Could be. So inflation, inflation uh, and a lot of the stuff going on in politics, which we will not get into. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. So that's it. Anything else that we left out? Uh, yeah. Just uh, you can't be fearful in negotiating your contract. And if you, and if for whatever reason you're opposed to this, as Dan had mentioned, uh, we will more than happily negotiate these budgets for you. Yeah, so plug everything again. If you need help getting studies, if you need help negotiating contracts and budgets, if you need help recruiting patients, if you need help finding doctors, if you need help, if you need help doing different types of studies, whatever it is you need help with, SOPs. Or if you just have a general question. Or a general question, I'll take those calls too. <laughs> Doesn't it have to be all business. I'll just talk to you like a normal person, right? Fair enough. Sometimes Chris will too. Sure. 949-415-6256. Also, Dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Uh, and one more thing, Intralinks Via, virtual workspace. Um, it's becoming almost mandatory to have something like this. And they're the first ones that made a product, Interlinks Via, specifically for clinical research companies, right? Whether you want to upload patient contact information, patient records, source docs, reg docs, helps you with your risk-based risk monitoring, your remote monitoring, uh, eliminates the need to keep faxing things or emailing things when you can give one of your monitors access to a specific folder and they can come in get what they need without even asking you for it. That's the best part. Sure. Eliminates all that mundane stuff that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and a lot of other stuff. So check them out too. Uh, what else? Uh, I thought of one more thing in regards to budgets. Ah, okay. What's that? Um, so a lot of times um, when you're negotiating the budget, you'll re reach an impasse between you and the CRO. Uh, in which case the CRO, if, if you're unwilling to budge, and the CRO will need to seek sponsor approval. I kind of alluded to that. Uh, you can lose the study if you will not budge. Uh, we've actually had this happen. We've had this happen? Yeah. I thought it's never happened. This has happened one time. What did they, they do? Uh, I'm not going to name the sponsor, but I'm sure you would remember if I named the sponsor. Um, their budget was very weak wasn't something that we were willing to do with the costs that they were presenting. Um, we said this would be the minimum we'll, we're willing to do the study for. Um, so they took it to the sponsor and the sponsor said no. And that was the end of it. That's it? Yeah. We they didn't it. even come back with a well, counter? They no, they came back and said this is the absolute max. Best and final, like in real estate. Exactly. Best and final. And we said, well, that's not enough. So I guess we'll part ways. And sometimes that's what you have to do. Right? Yeah. If it's, if it's not worth your while to do it, then, then why do it? Then why do it? Worst thing you want to do is take on one of these phase four studies because you don't have many many studies going on, and um, they're deceptively uh, difficult. So they look easy on the surface. Some of these studies last five years. Yep. You want to be seeing your monitor for the next five years for like a hundred dollars a visit. Well, we had, we Especially were, if that's a bad monitor. We had a study that we were thinking of doing. I don't know if you recall, but it was until the patient died. Ah. How about that one? Do you recall that? Yeah, I do recall that. We turned it down. Yeah. It's ridiculous, right? And they weren't paying very much. Yeah, and this that. wasn't something that people were terminally ill with either. And it's not something you can just decide you don't want to do anymore. Right. Right? Well, you could. I doubt you get another study from that sponsor. Yeah, some of these studies, just be careful with it. I wrote an entire article on uh, Interlinks and on Medium about phase four studies and how they could be more lucrative for sites. But unfortunately, right now, mid-2015, we're seeing a lot of phase four studies starting to change. I've been getting a lot more fe uh, feasibilities and CDAs for more traditional studies. So I think that's going to be the case going to end this year and going into 2016. We're going to see a lot more traditional phase one through three studies and a lot less phase four studies. At least, 
I hope so. I do have a question for you. Yeah. So in that scenario that I showed, that I explained a moment ago about losing that one particular study or parting ways, so we didn't actually lose it, but um, do you think when a CRO comes back and says, you know what, this is the sponsor's best and final, do you think they're ever fudging, not telling the truth? Or yeah. do you think that truly is the best and final? They're often not telling the truth. Yeah, you think there's room to go still? Yeah, I think if you can justify it, if if it's still reasonable what you're asking, if you can prove it with uh, Medicare reimbursements, if it's anywhere close to Medicare reimbursements, like within 50%. Okay, so in this case where we lost, again, didn't lose, uh, decided not to do that study, um, unless they could meet our price point, which wasn't, it wasn't, it was maybe, I think 30% more than what their best and final was. So was this a new study or an ongoing study? This was about two years ago. Yeah, but was it, uh, on, were we an add-on site or? No, it was a new study. Okay. So, uh, in that particular case, you would expect that, that to be actually their best and final. If, if we're only 30% were, apart. Yeah, and a lot of it comes down to how many sites they've already selected and negotiated budgets with. And what they're getting away with. Like and so they may sites. have an overall budget, or sometimes if the CRO is negotiating, they may have a budget that they don't want to exceed. Well, we've because actually that seen cuts these, into their profits. We've actually seen these budgets for one. Oh yeah, we have. They said, uh, my favorite emails of all time, by the way, for those of you sticking around, is, oops, my last email was not met for you. My favorite, you know what we found once? A CRO bid defense, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. My favorite, that's my favorite email I like to receive, often the best ones. But yeah, a lot of times they're losing, they have their own budget, the CRO, and they don't want to exceed it because then that cuts into their profits. And uh, I'm pretty sure these project managers at sponsors and at CROs have some kind of incentive to negotiate budgets. Lower budgets for at site level? Yes, for them. It would make sense. I oh, mean, absolutely. when we start running our CRO, which we're in the process of building, we're just reverse engineering it, we're building infrastructure, <laughs> and then we're going to add in CRAs and medical monitors, and then it's game over for the industry, all right? Uh, we're gonna do the same. I mean, it's just business, it's not personal. Cliche, but so true. Right? Yep, love it. All right, <laughs> thank you guys for watching uh, Periscope and Google Hangout, and I will see you guys later. Dan and Chris from theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Take care.